Hey guys, this is John, and I'm playing Alakine 101 in the 15-minute pool on ICC. Uh, this is a player I played before. Um, let's play the Scandinavian against him. reason I'm doing this opening against this particular player is I want to play something I'm comfortable with because they pressured me on the clock uh, in one game that we played. And I kind of want to control the pace of the game. Queen f3, just looking for an end game early on. Well, I never really backed down from this endgame. It's a little annoying to have to go into an endgame so quickly, but there's nothing uh, out of the ordinary about this particular endgame we can end up in if he trades on d5. So he plays knight c3. I might play queen back to d8 now. Could play queen d6 as well, but queen d8 is interesting. Yeah, let's do that. And we won't have a boring queenless middle game. <laughs> we had one in the last game. It wasn't that boring, but it was a queenless middle game. Check. So we'll keep uh, pieces on the board this time around. This is interesting. So bringing the bishop out, preventing me from playing knight c6, because I could knight c6, because I could just take on c6. Uh, if bishop d7, I would hang the b pawn, so I must play this move. Now I suspect bishop c4 will be the answer. And I could play knight bd7 now. Um, I could play bishop g4. I kind of think they're going to put their queen on g3 as a measure against uh, bishop g4. I could fianchetto my dark square bishop. I think I like knight bd7, though. So I'm going to opt for this move. I wonder if knight bd7, if they can put the queen back on e2, though. Hmm. And I wonder if bishop g4 is just a better move. It could be bishop g4, queen g3, and then just e6, standard development. Yeah, let's go with that. I wasn't sure about knight bd7, queen e2. So let's play it this way. Uh, before I get any further, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to Mr. Coleman Adamson, who uh, left a very nice comment on one of my videos uh, posted a couple days ago, one of my 15 minute videos. And Coleman was in the hospital. He was recovering from uh, cancer surgery. And he just left me a nice note saying that he really appreciated the videos and that uh, they were helping him get through the day, uh, which I thought was, was a really nice thing for him to say. And just wanted to say, Coleman, um, I and I'm sure all the other watchers of this series and my videos uh, wish you the best in your recovery. And uh, yeah, I hope you're back at the chessboard if you, if you actually play chess competitively, or even if you just play it casually, hope you get back to full strength in chess and in life soon. Okay, so he played d3, and I can't play my dark square bishop out. Oh, I could, I could play bishop d6. If I played bishop e7, he could play h3 and then go after my g7 pawn. So I think just bishop d6 is fine. Yeah, we'll see if he wants to play bishop f4 and swap bishops. Last time I played this guy, he built up a pretty nice time advantage in the opening, but I kind of killed the play a little bit, and then he wound up in time pressure towards the end. So I'm hoping I can repeat that feat this time around. Okay, let's just play knight bd7. Develop. You can play bishop g5, go for a pin, but I can just play h6 against that if I want. I don't foresee any huge problems. Going forward. Remains to be seen where he wants to develop this knight. Probably e2 will be played, but he might go through f3. Um, if immediately knight f3, then bishop takes, and I can mess up his pawn structure. So if he wants to go through f3, he's going to have to back my light square bishop off. White can play knight e4 here if they want. Idea being knight takes e4, queen takes g4 which uh, would attack my knight on e4 and also attack the pawn on g7. But if knight e4, I can always play bishop e7 if I want. And if he takes on f6, I replace it with my other knight. And I remain defending this point. So that's fine. He does play it. Okay, so if knight takes e4, queen takes, let's just check that line again. Because there's stuff like queen a5 check that could be interesting there. Or even bishop b4 check. 
But maybe he can just play king f1. And I got a lot of stuff hanging. He could also just play knight takes and then queen takes uh, d8 check and then recapture. So let's just play the move that we intended to. Just this one. Bishop g5. Very aggressive. So again, if I take on e4, there could be a capture on e7. Um, that's probably the move that will be played. Knight takes e4, bishop takes e7. If queen takes, he can again swap and then just take back on e4. I think that endgame after e5 would be roughly equal, though. Huh. What if knight e5 in this position? Knight e5, he'll just move his bishop back, probably. No biggie. Bishop f5 I could play. Bishop f5 would be a very safe option. But then he can take an f6, and yeah, we're going to be simplifying. Hmm. I want to be ambitious, but I'm seeing like several paths to equality that are just really easy. So I have to weigh that, how much risk I want to take versus just establishing normalcy in the position. And I outplayed him from a pretty balanced position last time. So I'm kind of thinking I should just go for maybe um, an equalish position and just play it out because equal is not necessarily drawn. It's important to remember. So knight takes e4, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7. If queen takes g4, then I think check here could be annoying for him because I can go after the b2 pawn. So I think knight takes e4, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, queen takes e7, king takes e7, d takes e4, and then just something like e5 is totally fine. Endgame is just equal. Okay, let's do that. And we're looking at a totally equal endgame coming up. Pre-move this. And I think queen takes g4 is bad. I don't think you should play that move because of check. Then I can go in that b2, b2 pawn like I was saying. So we might just force him to play a totally level endgame. Now I like e5 after he recaptures because um, then my bishop is able to get back. It's somewhat floating out on g4 when the pawn is on e6. It doesn't have anywhere to go. He was going to play f3 anyways, so I like this option. Hmm. So now if I want, I can take on e2 and get a knight versus bishop position. But there's no reason to do that. Probably just rook a d8 is good right now. Keep it simple. He can still play f3 if he wants to back my bishop off. I'll be looking to play knight c5 soon uh, if I want to attack this pawn. I might also send my knight somewhere else. Okay, knight g3. So he's eyeing the f5 square with that move. I think just g6 is okay. That way I keep the knight out of h5 and f5 permanently. And if he chases me, h3 or f3, I can just drop the bishop back. Does play f3. If he takes it, king takes. This knight is going to be repositioned some at some point. Probably pretty soon. It just has nothing to do on g3 anymore. Moves his bishop. So I guess he's maybe trying to derive some benefit uh, in the form of the open a file if I capture. Hmm. Okay, so moves I'm thinking about right now are knight c5. Uh, h5 would be a good space gaining move. I think knight c5 would be most typical though. Let's just do that. We got a long ways to go in this game. Could be a grind. Moves his king up. So now if I want, I could take 
He will take with the A pawn, though. I was thinking about repositioning the knight to E6. Also in this position, A5 is probably a good move. I could take on B3, B3 with my knight and argue that the bishop might be better than the knight with pawns on both sides of the board, but it's I think it's kind of too close to make that call yet. So let's play it like this. Just threatening A4. Maybe get him to take on E6, and then I'd be looking to take with my knight to have access to F4 and D4. Nothing much special going on, but as you've seen from uh, other videos where I played like queenless middle games, it often comes down to like who can grab space more effectively with their pawns, and often on the wings too. So you can see like I've already played a5 and I was mentioning h5, h4 just a moment ago. So all of these moves are uh, typical ideas. Okay, so if a4 he has to take then, I take with the knight, maybe knight f4. Is on the agenda. F5 is also possible now, too. Don't think I like F5 as much. It would threaten F4, but I don't know. Just doesn't seem like the right move at the moment. Let's play A4. I'm willing to go into this uh, two rooks plus knight end game each. Or queenless middle game. <laughs> There's no clear distinction between an end game and a queenless middle game. Some people just call an end game any, any time the queens come off the board, which I think is a little much. Okay, knight e2, so he just puts knight, the knight on a square where it uh, restricts me from coming in. Here it'd be interesting to play knight f4, idea being knight takes f4, e takes f4, king takes f4, rook d2. But I think the problem is if there's a trade on f4, you can just drop his king back to e2. No problem. f5 comes to mind. Again, just trying to squeeze him. f5, f4. He can maybe come to c3 at some point and attack this pawn on a4. If I play to double up on the d-file, there's just going to be trades. Like he's going to bring his rook over. It's going to be Swap City. So let's do this. I'll pre-move this capture. I somehow doubt he'll do that capture. So I'm hoping that I might get the chance to play f4 check and slowly squeeze him, like establish a space advantage on both sides of the board. Check. Okay, let's do this. I could try to take and then go about attacking the e-pawn, but I want to force his king back from e3. His king is well-placed on that square. Okay, not sure why he's thinking he has to play king f2. <laughs> so next I'll probably play g5. Um, yeah, and then try to expand further, like h5 and eventually g4. We've got six minutes, six and a half minutes. It's enough. I mean, I'd like to get him to think a little bit more. This guy's a speedster. If knight c3, I can always play that b5 move I mentioned. No big deal. Slow and steady will win the race here. Just methodically advance the pawns. We'll do that. b4. Okay, maybe trying to strand my A pawn? Hmm. It's just a bizarre looking move. <laughs> um, I mean, it creates some weaknesses. Like C3 is weak now. If I take Opposant, I bet he's taking with the A pawn. I could trade on D1 and then play Rook A8 and try to get the file. He goes knight c3, knight d4. That seems okay. What if I take and he takes with the c pawn, though? He might do that instead. Hmm. Nevertheless, I have a good feeling about that. 
Okay, let's try it. See which way he's willing to recapture. He could also take on d8 first, but um, he chooses to do it this way. Okay, so now we're going to bring the rook over. I like this. I feel like I might get some annoying pressure. He probably does not want to allow rook a2. So I was expecting knight c3 here, but that allows knight d4. And then my pieces are on great squares. Okay, so he's just moving his king. Maybe I switch back now, h5, try to go for g4. If rook a2, just king d2, it's hard to increase the pressure. Yeah, let's switch back over here. This is almost a principle of two weaknesses type position. Like, I'm probably not going to win this game just based on, you know, having the A file alone. I need to open multiple flanks if I want a chance to win. Hmm. So h3. I can play g4 and sack a pawn in order to get, like, rook g8 and then take on uh, g4, get that in. We can try to wait a while before doing that. There might be some other improving moves I can play in the meantime. Like b5, for instance. Probably won't regret the decision to play b5. Let's do that. Because I think I'll have g4 for a while. I don't feel like I have to play that right away. So gain some space. Might be helpful to play b4 to keep his knight out. It's a readily accessible move, so we take advantage. And if king d2, I kind of like the fact that his king is pulled away from uh, the king side. I think he's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place with his king. Like, I'm not sure, at least I wouldn't be sure if I were him, if I want to play my king over to f2 to assist the pawns over here, or if I want to play king d2 and try to defend that c2 pawn. So the less committal I can be right now, the more pressure he's going to have on his position. Just having seen the way this guy plays, um, I think this is absolutely a correct strategy against this player. I think just get them in something boring, and they don't really seem to like playing technical positions. And I'm just hoping to accumulate small advantages and win, and avoid tricky stuff. Avoid getting into um, the position I played in the very first game against them. <laughs> okay, b4 is a reasonable reply. So if I attack the pawn, it'd be nice if they played c3, but c3 is not forced. c4 is now weak. I could try to route my knight in there. It would take forever, though. Knight c7, e8, d6, etc. Probably just g4. Hmm. Can't really improve my king any further. Don't know that I want to move the knight. I don't know, getting into c4 could be good though. Down the line it could be good. Rook a2, they can just play, again, king d2, probably. Huh. So g4, we trade, trade, rook over. Let's say king f2, I take here, maybe rook h1 playing for activity. Then I have knight g5. Okay, let's do this. We're getting under three minutes, so maybe we will push the pace a little bit. I'm not sure. I might want to hold off on that move. It's tough to know. And I think he'll want to take, because otherwise I get g3 in and, and cramp him severely on the king side. g2 would become weak. He's probably going to take. I mean, I'd be pretty surprised if he didn't. So after takes, I could play knight g5, trying to go through e4, but he has this knight c3 move to defend. So I think better to play rook g8. It's going to force him to use a, a tempo with his king, at the very least. Because after I take on g4, I'll be threatening his g2 pawn. 
I am creating open files. So like, again, his rook can try to come over to h1 or maybe a1 when I abandon the file. But like the two weaknesses that I'll have will be e5 and c6. And my king can stand on d6 and guard both of them. So I like that. Whereas I feel like his weaknesses for him are harder to defend. Like he has to defend e4, maybe b4, maybe c2. They're far flung. Mine are easier to, to manage by just plopping my king on d6. I just got to make sure he doesn't coordinate his rook and knight. It's going to be tough for him to get his knight active, I think, but he might try some tricky route. If he's going to get his knight active, he has to bring it somewhere to attack e5. But I don't know how he's going to engineer that when e4 is so weak. That remains to be seen. I'm hoping this goes like last time where, you know, I was still down time for much of the game, but as it became clear that he was worse, he started using time. He can't easily get rid of the g-pawn. Like, let's say he plays king f2 and I take on g4. He can't just play g3 because I have knight g4. Well, actually, hmm. I thought I had knight g5, but maybe he could take on f4 then. Hmm. That would be annoying if he could simplify that quickly. But it's not out of the question. So king f2, rook takes g4, g3. If I play knight g5, he can take on f4. I take back knight c3, rook g3, rook d3. Maybe. Might be all right for him. If g3 immediately, I even have f3 if I want. Huh. Maybe he's crunching those variations right now. We'll see if he is coming up with that. King f2. Okay, so any reason to play knight g5 first? That would just force knight c3. Yeah, I don't think so. G3 makes sense. Okay, he's going to go passive instead. Rook d3. So now if knight g5, knight c3, everything's defended for him. Can I play rook h4 then? Maybe. Knight g5, knight c3, rook h4, trying to get activity with my rook. Yeah, let's do that. I'm straining my rook a little bit by doing this. It can't retreat, but again, I'm hoping to go to this file. Now this move. Maybe penetrating to h1 and coming over. Or if king g1 now, rook h8 and trying to come over this way. I'm not sure that d3 was the best square for this piece. He doesn't have any open files to work with right now. If g3, I'll just give a check on h2 and go after that c2 pawn. Yeah, I think he must realize it too because he's trying to reposition. Okay, let's just bring this over. Down. He has to play rook a1 now, I think. It's like the only reasonable thing to do. So rook a1, rook d8. He can always cover with his king, though. I still might want to play that, just to try to get his king to come to e2. Ah, because then I can put my rook on d4. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's something. He's going to play his king over right away. So if rook a8, rook h1, rook a3, king d2, I don't have anything. Okay, let's go for this move instead then. I kind of wanted to keep my knight attacking e4, but maybe I have to do this. Maybe looking to put the knight on d4 with check. That's the main plan. All 
All right, let's get in here. Is he going to play 92 if I do that? No, that doesn't work for him. He's got to do something passive. Like that. Okay, now we bring this over. Idea rook a3. Probably want to avoid a knight trade. Could trade, but trade and then play rook a3? Is that enough? Maybe that deserves attention. Okay, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not sure about this knight trade. Not quite sure. But I just have a hunch that this is still really tough for him to defend. I have a minute left. Because now rook e3 is the issue for him. Ah, rook d3. Missed that move. Okay. We'll still try this. King up. It's still tough for him to defend. Just the structural advantage persists. G3, okay. Let's go back here. Pre-move this. Rook b3. Well, at least I can take this now. His rook is overloaded trying to defend both of those points. Um, okay, let's go here. Gotta play quick now. Crucial. Go after the b4 pawn. Okay, well, this is looking good. 30 seconds left, though. What can we do with this with 30 seconds? I'm just going to keep his king out. Try to. Uh, let's go... Let's go here. Threatening, like, rook g3 stuff. I'm still pressing. Go here, threatening to take with check. Can play king f5 now though. Check. Time work. Hmm. I just don't want to draw. Check. Okay, I'm going for this. I'm still going to try to win. This is pretty risky, but. With the time, I think it's it's probably okay to do this. Rook c1 coming next. Eh, it's probably not enough, though. You can get his king up. Yeah, my king's too far away. Just a little bit too far. Check. He's going to come and shoulder my my king, too. Okay, yeah, this is a draw. All right, yeah, too bad. I must have had a win in that rook end game towards the end there. Just didn't quite have the, the time to figure it out. I somehow need to keep his king out. Hmm. Didn't want to have to move my king. Tough to say. Okay, let's take a look at it. So Scandinavian, where he offers an early queen trade, queen f3, and then knight f6. So I was okay with the, the trade happening on d5. At least I get a little bit of development. See, we're both playing, like, he plays knight c3 now. We're trying to further our development and do the queen trade at the same time. Like, he wants to take on f3 so he can take with his knight. But here I avoided the trade. Check. Bishop b5 check. It's an interesting idea. The computer likes it. Check. Because um, it stops knight c6, and it kind of forces me to put the pawn on c6, which I might not want to do. In this position. Normally this is the structure for black, but with the queen not on f3, there's some uh, abnormal considerations. 
So queen g3, I played e6, he went d3, bishop d6, queen h4. Okay, so pretty good position. You know, just drop the bishop back to e7, bishop g5. Now I took. Okay, did I miss something here? Because the computer really likes queen Check. a5. I thought about that move for a split second, but I didn't really see the point. What if b4, queen e5, x-raying the king, attacking the rook? Tricky. <laughs> and apparently black is winning. Mm. Yeah, I can't say I looked at queen a5 much, just beyond a cursory glance. I mean, what if queen a5, Check. and he just, I don't know, plays... I guess king d2 runs into bishop, check. doesn't it? Oh, that's a very cute checkmate. Here, check. double check, king f1. Check. And then this mate. Check mate. That's beautiful. Smothered mate. Um, but yeah, I didn't look at it beyond check. this and just seeing that he could play like a pawn move to block the check. And I was thinking, well, what am, what am I doing here? I've lost a bishop and I have two pieces hanging, my knight on e4 and the bishop on g4. Wow. But apparently this is good. Now knight takes c3. That's very complex. In an OTB game, I might have spent more time thinking about that, though. Check. Probably would have. Uh, so we got this trade in, and then e5. I might have a slight pull in this endgame, just because I'm a bit better organized. My rooks are already connected. My king's up on e7. Uh, because the queens are off the board, we can both confidently keep our kings in the center. That's the general rule. And I've found it to be true most of the time. Hence why it's a general rule. <laughs> but if the queens are off the board... Um, you often don't want to castle because you want to prepare for the end game. You want to have your king in the middle with the most options possible and trying to play for a win. So g6, I think this is a good strategic move just to keep his knight out. Yeah, I really felt like I had a pleasant position. And as I said, these positions often boil down to like who can grab more space and set themselves up for later. Um, and then playing a5, I'm trying to stake out as much queen side space as possible and also just cramp him, like force him to a decision with the light square bishop soon. So here, okay, so the engine does like f5 right away, threatening this. And what if he just does the same thing he did in the game? Ah, he, okay, Check. so here I can actually get into d2 with the rook. So the rook comes in. That will be a bother, because then I can prepare to double. Yeah, this doesn't look that good for him. So... I played a4 first, though. Maybe f5 would have been a bit better there. Because now he gets time to put a rook on d1. Check. Probably minimizes his disadvantage. But this is very nice for black still, because I have more space than him. I probably control, like, you know, after pushing these pawns, like, two-thirds of the available space, and he has the remaining third. b4 was kind of bizarre. Not a move that, to me, like, easily comes to mind. Hmm. And I did take on Passant. I was a little bit torn about that because I felt like maybe I could keep my A pawn. Like in a lot of end games, like let's say I play A3, also seems to be a reasonable move. A lot of times uh, when the position is simplified, it'll be nice that this pawn is so close to promotion. And tactically, it might, um, it might open up some opportunities whereby I can go and attack that A2 pawn and just try to knock it out and promote, basically. But uh, I swapped and then... Took on d8. I think I mentioned a line like he could take here first if he wanted. Ah, oh, but I guess I have b2 in between move. I don't have to take his rook right away. And then maybe like rook b1, rook takes d8, take, and I have a structural edge on the queen side. Something to work with. Another thing to add to our portfolio of strategic advantages here. But he just took back. We traded rooks. I got the a file. So I need to play on both flanks in order to win this position. Like if you eliminate the pawns on one flank here, like let's say we get rid of the queen side pawns and it's just four versus four on that side of the board. That's still better for black, but it's probably not winning. Um, likewise, if we eliminate all the king side pawns, um, then it would just be totally even. So the way that you're gonna try to win this end game is by creating threats on both wings and quickly switching sides of the board. When you have more space, you can often swing your pieces over easier, as you saw with like my rook trying to shift directions. His rook was a little discombobulated. So h5, and here I went b5. I guess the engine says I can go ahead and play g4 if I want right away. But to be quite honest, I was pretty happy with how I played this position over the next several moves. Rook over, okay, so it thinks 
maybe knight g5 or rook a2 is also good. Why is rook a2 so strong? Tie him down to the pawn. So let's say rook d2, for instance. Rook a4, go back and attack that. Okay. And if c3, now knight g5. Okay, so maybe trying to induce the pawn to move to c3 so that we can play knight g5 when the knight can't go there to defend it. Sneaky, sneaky. Okay. King f2. Okay, and here I took. And I was wondering if after I took, they could play g3. Maybe this move is more promising. Forcing knight to c3 to defend, oops, to defend the e-pawn, and then come back with a rook. Because actually, with their king on f2, I have a tactical threat. Rook a3, rook d3, rook takes c3. And if they take back, I have knight takes e4 with the check and the fork. Granted, their, uh, their king will probably not be standing on the square, but uh, it's something that comes to mind. And you notice how I can tie their, their rook and their knight down at the same time. Um, that's a big advantage. It's kind of the fruits of our maneuvering here and the fruits of our space advantage. I can tie his knight and rook down uh, pretty easily if I want, actually. Mainly the knight. The rook maybe not so much, but the knight I can tie down. Like as soon as the knight comes to g5, his knight has to go to c3. In fact, he's really banking on his rook activity to try to save himself. Knight g5, knight c3, rook h4. Yeah, this looks good. Maybe he missed the um, the opportunity to play g3. I think he definitely did, according to the computer. And he could try to swap the g for the f pawn. And if he can do that, then he might equalize the pawn structure. Yeah, that seems to be the move. Check. Take here. And black has like a very modest edge. That's not enough to do anything with, realistically, probably. But he just played rook d3, and that gave me another opportunity. Knight g5, knight c3. Okay, rook h2 was good here. I didn't play that. Rook h2 trying to go, whoops, not rook h1. <laughs> rook h2. And then if king here, there's this move. Okay, and then if I assume... If this, I have an check. h3 check. Here, take, take, f2, the pawn queens. Okay. So if here, he might have had to play king f1, and then I can play f3. He takes, I assume I go take, okay, knight, knight takes f3 first. And now his king is very much restricted. He can't move at all. Confined to the back rank. I'm threatening rook takes c2. This does look awesome. <laughs> it wouldn't be out of the question for my king to try to come up and assist, too. Mm. Well, we were doing the uh, two-minute drill here. We had two minutes left to try to win this position. So I played knight over. I tend to do that sometimes, as I think a lot of people do. Like, when I get low on time, I try to minimize the risk, even when I'm better. Like, I'll sometimes... Like, here's a good example. Like, I kind of felt like maybe I should keep the knight, but I knew that would um, make the game slightly more complicated. And with a minute and a half, I wanted to minimize uh, any risk of like losing and overpressing. So I figured like just trade this, this rook end game's easier to play and it's still good. Rook d3 was a good defensive move. Oh really, I can just take this pawn or take this rook? Yeah, I didn't properly assess this transition to the pawn end game, but the computer thinks it's winning. King takes, so I'm gonna move my king up this way, huh? Let's say just directly king here, king here, king here. Ah, because I get to h4 in time. Then I'm going to muscle him out. I'm going to outflank him. I'll play king over to g4 once this king moves. What if he just plays c3, though? King h5. Okay, the reason for king h5, that's precision, is that if he plays g3, I can take on g3 and then gain the opposition. And I'm trying to get into f4. He must play king f3, and then I go here. Yeah, and I'm going to slowly win this pawn. Say, for instance, king f2, king here, uh, king here here and he can't hold he doesn't have any like waiting moves so we're slowly gonna outflank him and win the e-pawn and win the game hmm that's instructive rook takes d3 i mean in it i kind of took him at his word that this uh pawn end game was not a win and i didn't really think about infiltrating with my king over here but yeah it looks like taking is the way to go if pawn takes, king d6 is good, trying to create a pass pawn this way. That makes sense. Because his g pawn is not a concern. So yeah, we can just play c5, force the swap, and get a pass b pawn. And he has like three versus two on the g file for the 
through the D file, but he can't create a pass pawn easily in any place. So that's also a win. All right, so missed opportunity there. Now we get to this rook end game that I also thought I might be able to, to win. Hmm. Here, rook g3 would be good for him. Why? Again, g3. Yeah, this g3 move plays a big role. If he's able to play g3 successfully, he can maybe hold the draw. He did it here. I went rook a4 back. Check. I thought he was just going to take now on f4, but he went check. Check. Rook back. I took on g3. Yeah, rook b3, he didn't defend very well um, until the very last, like, 10 moves or so. F takes g3. He went here. I went after his c pawn. He goes and gathers my g pawn, but I win the b pawn. Yeah, and I felt like this must be winning. It just uh, didn't have the time and didn't play it accurately enough either. King g4 was a... Okay, so here he started defending resourcefully. This was good. Because he's got to go for activity. I think if he tries to bring his king back here, I just play b4 and he doesn't have much in the way of counterplay. But at least king g4, he introduces the idea of king f5 all the time. And I wanted to play to stop that. So we swap these pawns. b3. Okay, I played rook c3 first. b3. King g4. Hmm, maybe this is not a win. Seems like it should be, though. In any case, it's tricky now. King f6, let's just follow the computer's top line. King f6, rook check. f2, check. King g7. <laughs> kind of subtle, I guess. I, I guess the idea here is after this to go king g6 and try to put him in some sort of a zugzwang. If he moves his rook, I can play rook e3 and win this pawn with check. Okay. And his king can't come up. Ah, but he can play king f5 now. Rook c5, rook b2, rook b5, get behind the pawn. Rook g2, check. check, king f7. This is all hypothetical stuff, but king e7. Okay, and once my rook is defending this, maybe I can try to walk up. But he, or not walk up that way, walk up this way. But um, it all depends if he can keep his king close to my pawn. King e6, king g4. Like, case in point, if here, king f5, if I come here, he takes. And he can try to draw in the same manner he did in the game. King c6. Ah, I can go all the way around. Okay. That should have been obvious to me. But <laughs> I can play my king up through b6 and then a5, and then go up here. And the rook remains defending this pawn on e5 at all times. And his rook can never really leave, because I played b2. I guess he could sacrifice for the b pawn. Like, maybe when my king gets to a5? How would that work? Let's say like something like this. King a5, take. But now, compared to the game, my king is a lot closer. I can come back faster. Yeah, this, Check. this will be winning for me. Pretty si simply, actually. Aha, uh -huh. so there might have been a win there. That's close. But there might have been a win with like something more subtle, like king f6. King f6, rook f2, king g7. <laughs> Trying to come here. Even here, I'm not so sure. The computer seems a little... Uncertain about it still. But I did this and then, yeah, 20 Check. seconds left, try to Check. make something happen. But once I do this and he takes the e-pawn, um, I've had a couple games like this in the 15-minute category, actually, where I've been on the drawing side of this, where you have to give up your rook, but you have a runaway pass pawn, and that's enough to, to hold the draw. Yeah, and he showed good Check. understanding of this. Um, not that he couldn't draw just by pushing the king in the pawn, but this this idea is called shouldering, for those who don't know. He's playing king e5 to d6, not only to support the pawn's advance, but also so that if my king were to come back, he's kind of taking away squares that my king can go to. He's shouldering my king out of the way. So Check. Now it is a draw. I'll have to give up my rook for the pawn eventually. Draw. Okay, so this is a nice technical game. Um, would have liked to have won it, but I think it showed a lot of like key ideas in playing technical positions like this, like grabbing space using your pawns, um, playing on both flanks, principle of two weaknesses, and uh, just needed a little bit more down the stretch to get the full point. Um, interesting stuff. 
So thank you guys for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with another standard video. Talk to you guys later. Bye.